So, all right, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to uh, our Developmental Disability Clinical and Research Rounds. Um, this week, we are fortunate to have Dr. Miriam Nori from London Health Sciences Center join us to talk about epilepsy care. Um, and for those who don't know Dr. Nori, uh, the, um, so she received her medical degree from Iran University of Medical Sciences in Tehran in 2009 and then uh, later moved to Toronto and did her residency in neurology and pediatric neurology at the University of Toronto. Through a fellowship grant from the Canadian League Against Epilepsy, she finished her uh, neurophysiology and pediatrics epilepsy uh, fellowship at the University of British Columbia with a focus on EEG interpretation and epilepsy surgery evaluations. Uh, and then we were fortunate enough here in London to have her move over uh, to, um, to Western. Uh, and she joined the department in pediatrics and clinical neurological sciences in 2018. Um, Dr. Nuri also has completed a uh, master's degree in clinical epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and um, her real focus, apart from the fact of being a phenomenal clinician, uh, her research is devoted to sort of advanced diagnostic working people with drug resistant epilepsy and neuroimaging. And just on a side note, uh, what I have always been impressed with, with in talking with Dr. Nori is just the fact that it seems to me, Miriam, that you are focused on the big picture of patients as opposed to just one issue. And I think that for families, I think they really, really appreciate that. Uh, like thinking about the girl we see together who had developed OCD and there was or all the kids we've talked about with ADHD who your senses are undertreated and things uh, right. because of worries. And, and I think that families really appreciate it. And certainly the fact that you're so available is incredibly helpful to me. Uh, I don't know how you feel about being so available, but it's, but it's incredibly helpful to me for sure. That, so, that feeling uh, is mutual. So I really appreciate the same responses from your group as well. So Dr. Nori, today we'll talk about a, towards a comprehensive epilepsy care in children and a focus on the future. So uh, Miriam, if you want to put your slides up, that would be great. Uh, yes. Uh, Perfect. So I am probably, does that work? Okay. Yep. yep, looks fine. Okay, great. Perfect. So thank you so much for having me. And I really look forward to um, uh, to this hour. I've worked very closely with many members of your division. So it always, and I've had, and oh, most of you have been very generous to come on our round. So I really uh, look forward to um, discussing some of the interests that I have and some of the work that we've been doing uh, and uh, some of the av avenues for uh, future collaboration and, and growth uh, as, uh, as, a, yeah, as a division or two devoted uh, to care of patients with epilepsy. So my talk will be really towards a comprehensive epilepsy care in children and, and with a focus on future and research. Um, so my, our objectives is really to review some of the new definitions put forward by the International League Against Epilepsy on epilepsy syndromes and drug resistant epilepsy, um, and discuss the new entity of developmental epileptic encephalopathies that have come really to forefront on, uh, of, uh, uh, some of our classifications. And like to then spend some time focusing on cognitive and neurodevelopmental comorbidities in patients with the above two entities, and then focus on uh, the future with some promise of the research, the work that's being done elsewhere and some of the work that we're doing here. Um, so to set the stage, I'd like to talk about probably one of the mutual patients that we share. It's about a 13-year-old boy uh, from Afghanistan who started having seizures uh, from the first year of life with what parents indicate a concomitant developmental delay. This was global, involving many aspects. Um, it, from what they would describe to me was first a developmental delay, then shortly thereafter was followed by seizures. In terms of risk factors, there wasn't much uh, in, in history, um, including no family history, no perinatal complications, no intracranial infections or trauma. Family had sought treatment really globally. So they were first um, uh, relocated to East Asia and then before coming to Canada. And I know they, from they, what they tell me, they had spent fortunes trying to solve and fix their son um, and with trying many medications um, and, and at 
MRIs, EEGs, paying out of pocket. And by the, well, by the time I saw him when he was 13, he had failed many anti-seizure medication. He was nonverbal. He was able to walk, but had severe behavioral dysregulation and was really functioning at a low level. He hadn't attended any meaningful, edu- you know, he had not received any meaningful education, had not been placed in any school, um, you know, throughout their journey. So it was really sort of almost neglected. And patients' main seizure type at the time was generalized onset um, tonic-clonic seizure. So really at this stage, when we see that patients like this, um, uh, you know, the main question is, are we dealing with a severe developmental epileptic encephalopathy? Does the patient have other uh, concomitant neurodevelopmental disorders, such as a, a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder? And are we missing etiologic specific disorders, such as a, a, a genetic uh, contribution? Neither one of these have really been explored uh, in this patient um, while they were searching for a way to fix their child and, 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 you know, with the hope of coming to Canada and, and finding an, uh, a cure. So I'd like to then start uh, our, uh, our, the rest of the talk by said, by talking, starting to talk with, uh, with um, how we approach epilepsy. That can be journey, uh, any patient with seizures and or epilepsy, the journey really starts basic. We ask the very basic question of what is the nature of the seizures? Are we talking about focal onset versus generalized onset? That's generally really uh, as simple as that, and it really uh, does set the stage. Um, So then the next question is based on what the underlying etiology is, what the underlying seizure semiology is, then we think of many different etiologies, structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, immune, or of course, unknown, it's still always there. We always like to make the bubble of other uh, diagnostic etiologies bigger and make the unknown bubble as as small as possible. And then once we have the the big type and the subheading of the epilepsy diagnosis, then we get into specific types of seizures. And of course, then we think of epilepsy syndromes. And uh, and with that, there is a big cloud and big association with uh, comorbidities. Um, uh, depending on the etiology, the type of seizures and epilepsy syndrome. So the to me, the biggest question after um, the main type of seizure is when did the seizure start? So for example, in this patient uh, that we were just talking about, it was a 13-year-old patient, but the seizure had started in the first year of life and they were generalized in onset. Right there and there, we're thinking we're, you're moving away less from a structural cause and more probably towards a genetic cause. And these are new census, new numbers that have been just put out by uh, the uh, Epilepsy Ontario. Um, I, I think it's as, as recent as last year, uh, where um, there give, it's just some numbers. And really important to note that um, you, there's just a 16% of patients with epilepsy onset uh, between zero to 17 years of age. And this is really not incidence, mostly prevalence. So as you see, as get, they get older, of course, you have the highest prevalence in patients between 18 to 16 at 64 years of age. Uh, but in any case, uh, we the division by age uh, is uh, ranging from neonates to infants to child, adolescents, and adults. And depending on what age the seizure starts, it helps us with uh, the etiological journey uh, of trying to find an underlying cause for the patient's presentation. Uh, so then there are uh, newer, further definitions uh, put forward by ILE. Then, uh, of course, a, a step forward from focal onset is trying to characterize it more. Is it motor onset, non-motor onset? Same goes with generalized onset or unknown. Again, these um, uh, distinctions are quite important in trying to understand the severity of the seizures, uh, the etiology of the seizures. For example, we think of generalized onset motor seizures Um, as overall being a more severe uh, disease uh, and probably one needs that that needs uh, escalation of uh, therapy um, uh, versus generalized onset non-motor seizures, which is absence, perhaps not that we tolerate it more, but are in terms of uh, choices of medications and how aggressive we are with managing them, we may be setting out a different threshold. So that's why it becomes very important to get to the bottom of, you know, not just epilepsy, but what kind and and um, even within generalized, you taking it a step forward of distinguishing between motor and non-motor. 
And then, of course, this is again one step, one another stage forward, even amongst the motor patients, we say is this tonic, clonic, or clonic only, or tonic. And again, at this stage, this helps us with putting these patients into epilepsy syndrome boxes. Uh, for example, a patient with generalized onset uh, motor seizure, mostly in form of myoclonic, um, sorry, mostly in form of tonic and atonic seizures would lead us think of more of a diagnosis of a Lennox gastro, for example, or if it's more epileptic spasms, then we'll be heading towards IS versus if there's a child with a myoclonic dominant epilepsy, then we're thinking of generalized, genetic generalized epilepsy. And I'd be touching up on that a little bit more in the for next slides. So now with, this is very recent. I actually put ILA, but didn't put the year. This is from last year in 2022, where the, the really the, the society at large is always trying to um, keep up with the growth of, um, with the, growth of, uh, of the science and our access to testing. Um, so we are now seeing um, a changes in terminology in how we describe seizure um, syndromes, epilepsy syndromes, sorry, for example, you know, one big category is self-limited epilepsy. So I'm sure you've heard of benign Olandic epilepsy. So we're sort of trying to replace that with more of a self-limiting uh, uh, notion, uh, just because we're learning that really nothing is benign when it comes to epilepsy, rather self-limiting. So we now have a, a category of self-limiting epilepsies and newly uh, put forward is the developmental epileptic encephalopathies, where we it, they used to be known as epileptic encephalopathies, um, but now we, as we're learning more about the etiologic specific syndromes, we're understanding that there is a new entity um, born from there called developmental epileptic encephalopathy, which I will get to. And on top of that, we do have these uh, another uh, category of genetic generalized epilepsy. And these are really a group of condition characterized by by what we presume to be an underlying genetic etiology, which is generally, well, most times is very complex in inheritance and mostly are polygenic. And they are patients that can often have a family history and uh, we see different levels of cognition, neuro exams and response to treatments. And we rely so much on the phenotype of the presenting uh, seizure type, as well as age of onset. Um, and their EEG findings to then group it together and give it a name. So we do use epilepsy syndromes. This is different to a genetic syndrome. I always tell our trainees, do not get confused. We do have a lot of genetic syndromes in, in neurology that present with epilepsy, but epilepsy syndromes um, are also an entity in and of itself. Then we use essentially three to four pieces of information and label it as an epilepsy syndrome. Um, and that's where we can then um, um, again, get one step closer to trying to uh, have a more of a homogenized approach uh, to these patients. Uh, so most common epilepsy syndromes that you probably have heard are infantile spasms or West syndrome, lennox gastro syndrome, childhood absence epilepsy. I put benign focal epilepsies of childhood, just not to confuse you because it's a new terminology that we're now using uh, self-limiting epilepsies of childhood. And um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy are one of the more common epilepsy syndromes. And um, and in in an and after a diagnosis essentially is made, you try your first, and then often you have to move on to your second anti-seizure medication. Um, so the drug-resistant epilepsy is really coined uh, when you have failure of two adequately adequate trials of appropriately chosen anti-seizure medication. I should say a disclaimer is that uh, the word anti-epileptic drugs has really been replaced with anti-seizure medication for some obvious reasons, uh, just to really take the epileptic piece out of this. So you probably see us more using more of the anti-seizure um, medication as opposed to anti-epileptic drugs. And approximately 30% of our patients globally, whether they're focal or generalized, whether they have an epilepsy syndrome or not, they are then diagnosed with drug-resistant epilepsy. And this really, uh, the, uh, the accountable reasons can be many folds. Um, you know, it's, it's failure to recognize an epilepsy syndrome, poor drug compliance, lifestyle factors, incomplete workup, amongst other things. <laughs> 
So now on to our um, developmental and or epileptic encephalopathy. So really in, 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 in simple words, this, re this denotes to an entity where you have a common underlying cause that's responsible for both your developmental delay as well as your, uh, your both is, is responsible for both a developmental encephalopathy and, and an epileptic encephalopathy. And the epilepsy can also impact a development, but it's not the sole cause. So this often becomes confusing because most, you know, most patients believe that if you fix epilepsy, you can fix development. And I think with the invent and development of this coin, we've been able to uh, be more confident in relaying a similar message that that's really not the case, that we have patients and most of our patients with, with uh, you know, gene-specific etiologies, the developmental component is really independent of the epileptic encephalopathy. And even the developmental delay may precede the seizure onset, as was the case with the patient that I was presenting. And although the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies can occur both um, you know, simultaneously, and both can really impact the development. And the epileptic activity can also influence the neurocognitive and behavioral outcome, but this is not the full picture. As uh, we do try our best to really uh, try to mitigate and improve um, the epilepsy portion of things, but that doesn't often lead to a developmental improvement. Um, so it's very important to keep in mind, and that's why I think this is this terminology has helped us all to be on the same page. And of course, with DEE, there are a lot of co comorbidities seen, such as cerebral palsy, autism, and intellectual disability. And outcomes can be poor, especially if we're talking about specific genes such as SDXBP1 or KCNQ2. And this is um, talking about uh, some of the this neurocognitive impairment in patients who may have a developmental encephalopathy versus developmental epileptic encephalopathy with dual impact on cognition from both a developmental and epileptic uh, and an epileptic encephalopathy perspective versus patients who only have DEE and are impacted only by the epileptic encephalopathy and don't have an underlying. Uh, developmental issue. And we do see the etiology is the most important thing, and that varies. So when you're talking about a patient with only a developmental encephalopathy, and perhaps these patients can later develop seizures, but it's not the main um, contributor to, to their developmental encephalopathy. These are mostly patients with static uh, conditions such as HIE, hypoxic brain encephalopathy, where you may get you know, generalized or focal clinical uh, seizures. Age of onset can be from very early on. And most patients that have early onset developmental encephalopathy um, show signs of it in the first year of life. And cognition is often abnormal. And with established cases, you get some level of an EEG abnormality. Perhaps it may not be epileptic encephalopathy, but some level of abnormality. And cognitive outcomes are generally also remain poor in these patients. Now, contrasting that with DEE, where a typical patient would be a patient with TSC, for example, or Dravet syndrome, which is caused by SCN1A. And most of the other commonly um, uh, gene mutations, as some of which we'll touch on today, is that, again, although the clinical picture may not very be vastly different, uh, but we may probably see that the cognition portion may be more severely impacted and you may have more severe epileptic uh, abnormalities. The difference I find with the DEEs that are truly caused by a gene is that we're now learning more and more about whether we would have any targeted therapies or whether these patients would uh, you know, qualify for clinical trials or precision medicine. So at least if I find there is a, a you know, this, this newly coined entity where, where it's been around, it's just that we're thinking about it differently, um, really does open up the door, like we'll speak uh, shortly uh, of, of maybe some potential new therapies in contrast to patients who already have in static etiology. And then you will hear about uh, some of the patients who only have a specific epileptic encephalopathy in, abs in patients that have a normal developmental um, his trajectory otherwise. And these are mostly patients with um, what we call CSWS, where you have these continuous spike wave in sleep. Uh, and these are patients with um, some acquired uh, epileptic encephalopathies that are not necessarily a cause of, uh, not caused by a gene underlying genetic disorder and they're developmentally normal.
So this is again showing us, for example, comparing uh, patients with uh, infantile spasm. And if you have, if you pay attention to cognition on the y-axis and then years uh, and age in years in the x-axis, you'll see that you can have a onset, a child with onset of epileptic spasms. This is a child who has an HIE, for example. You'll get your already. You're talking about a non-progressive brain state. You develop infantile spasm, which causes a, a, a perhaps a regression, a neuro regression with high dose steroids and, and, and all that. And then once you treat the spasms, this does improve, but your this patient is not going to get, it's not going to improve any further than that. Probably it's going to land on a bit of a poor, um, a bit of a poor um, neurodevelopmental status any uh, after the onset and offset of the seizure. However, if you could contrast this to a patient who doesn't have an underlying cause, like an idiopathic West syndrome, they start off uh, with spasms at a normal development. And once their whole uh, journey is over, they can essentially land in the same area and not have any developmental sequelae. Again, important to note, again, thinking about the underlying cause and the interplay between um, epilepsy and development. And I made that, I blew this one up because it's about Dravet syndrome. So the patients with Dravet syndrome are more of a, so to say, uh, you know, it's it's a most common common single gene mutation in epilepsy. Uh, as we'll talk about shortly, this is one uh, mutation that has gained a lot of attention because of the interest in gene therapies. So these patients generally start from a normal development, and then they have recurrent febrile seizures. And of course, at in the duration of active deterioration, we also see that they neurocognitively regress. And they plateau, and uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, despite our best efforts to even improve their seizure control, this is again a a, a, a very good example of a developmental epileptic encephalopathy where the underlying STN1A mutation is responsible for your developmental delay as well as your epilepsy. And although the epilepsy sort of takes over uh, in this acute um, uh, deterioration phase, uh, but even with, uh, as we see, as the patients progress um, between ages one and five, their seizures actually start stabilizing over time and they're not as active um, from a seizure perspective, but their development essentially um, is, has already worsened and stays at a, um, um, uh, you know, stays quite far away from their baseline. And that's the nature of a Dravé syndrome. And often parents of these children um, come to us and say, you know, uh, you know, we thought it was the epilepsy. Now we fixed the epilepsy. Why hasn't the patient's, you know, autism improved, underlying neurodevelopmental disorders and all that. So this is, again, a perfect example of that. So then, um, Moving a step forward, uh, talking about the relationship between all the seizures and comorbidities. Um, so we do um, know that, of course, that we are well aware of the, the very close interplay, uh, the relationship between um, the, the epilepsy, the under underlying neuropathogenic mechanisms and the comorbidities. And this actually then um, taking a closer look at all the abnormalities that we see, and, and we can see some of these pages, some of the findings such as intellectual disabilities, slow processing of speed, fine motor dexterities, essentially are possible in all children with epilepsy. Add to that list is ADHD, which is again common in all children with epilepsy. Autism is more selective. We mostly see it in epileptic encephalopathies or DEEs. Um, and behavioral uh, problems, again, are mostly are seen in patients with lower um, IQ or with intellectual disability. But really to show that, again, you, your, your group is well aware of the cognitive um, comorbidities and the high rate of uh, the cognitive comorbidities in our patients with epilepsy. And these often go unrecognized and seizures and epilepsy is way more than the seizures. And um, I guess are we know we, we've become um, in a way as neurologists, we feel comfortable managing the seizures, but we often do not feel comfortable with managing the comorbidities or even screening for them adequately. Um, and so even uh, we are guilty of, uh, of, of making sure our patients um, are really 
fully um, and uh, holistically, uh, as uh, Rob was saying, uh, our, our approach. And it's not just looking at them with the, with the lens of, of, of epilepsy. In this study that was done in children with epilepsy in Sussex schools in 2014, they demonstrate that about, uh, you know, combining all together, about 60% of all of their kids had some sort of a, a comorbidity. And we can see autism was reported about 21%, ADHD 33%, OCD 19%. And overall, they they finalized that about 80% of their children had some sort of a DSM-4 uh, criteria. And they were, prior to the diagnosis of epilepsy, they only 20% only had had a previous diagnosis. So these most of these other comorbidities were diagnosed after a diagnosis of epilepsy. And in this study, they found that the factors associated with intellectual disability was having experienced seizures in the first 24 months of life, generalized seizures, diagnosis of ASD and polytherapy. And needless to say, these comorbidities really impact the quality of life of children and their, um, and their, patient, and their parents. And another big question that I'm sure is always in everybody's mind is how does our, the choice of medications influence the cognition and behavior? Again, uh, we become uh, we be, we get so used to our the medications that we choose that uh, we um, we always think you know of course we're always looking to mitigate the side effects. Uh, but I think this was a very good report that came from the ILAE task force um, that, again, with a cautious behavior is where you have sufficient data to recommend careful monitoring due to risk of potential adverse events. So you see some of the older um, AEDs or anti-seizure medications, as well as the newer ones. Uh, are as part of the caution, cognition, and behavior. And, and then you have those that are neutral cognition and behavior where there's not enough evidence um, and evidence exists, uh, not enough evidence to support that they have uh, cognitive or behavioral side effects. And of course, we have medications such as Lamotrigine and, and Keppra that actually in fact can have positive cognitive and behavioral side effects. So we again have to really keep these medications and their side effects in mind, especially with, in a population of patients with severe epilepsy who already have a lot of underlying tendency uh, for um, uh, uh, side effects in the cognitive and behavioral domain. And this was a work that we did actually as part of my, um, my master thesis. We wanted to look at the impact of number of anti-seizure medication on long-term uh, quality of life. Again, the question always is, as you're accumulating medications, does that really impact long-term quality of life? And this was a study done on some um, data that we have in, in London um, with where we uh, looked at health-related quality of life at two and 10 years. And in fact, we found a number of anti-seizure medication did not impact the long-term quality of life at 10 years. What really impacted that was their health-related quality of life at two years. So we thought that most of the studies that are looking at the, the, the impact of a number of anti-seizure medication and quality of life in long term should really keeping uh, keep um yeah, take an account take for it oh, sorry uh, keep uh, account for uh, health related quality of life early uh, in their course um not necessarily because that with the most that was the most important um modifier um, so moving on to some of the cognitive issues uh, amongst uh, amongst patients with epilepsy, it's one of the most significant concerns. Again, uh, quite under recognized, and and I come to learn that really the intellectual disabilities are diagnosed mostly as they as they go through the school years. So it's very hard. We, we can pick up some tendencies and um, early on, but uh, we they don't get the formal diagnosis of intellectual disability until they're, they're in school. And we know that about 40% of the population with active epilepsy can have intellectual disability compared to 25% in, in population-based studies. And academic issues are as common as 80%. Um, with some sort of an academic problem and um, and uh, most common uh, cognitive issues are really attention um, and encoding processing of speed and, and issues with memory. And what I think is uh, probably the most underdiagnosed is ADHD. I find um, the reduced attention span, uh, of course, is, is a big issue in our patient population. I, in fact, think all of our patients 
uh, most, if not all of our patients should be screened with ADHD. I mean, but perhaps not all of them need to be on medication, but I, I think um, it's a very, very high um, uh, um, prevalence and incidence of ADHD uh, in our patient population, up to 40% in some population studies and 60% in our patients with intractable epilepsy. And it differs from the classical ADHD type where you have most of the in it, inattentive subtype is the most common and girls and boys are equally uh, represented. And treatment, um, I find a very, I mean, I think that this is based on some of the literature, but I also see this in my practice as positive effect of stimulus in children, I find they already are going with a low reserve. So ADHD really tips them off. Um, and I find, and we often have this discussion uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, some of my colleagues that whether any of the stimulants can actually lower the seizure threshold, which often is reported. But I find given that this patient population is already being closely monitored for seizures, that a risk of seizure exacerbation is extremely low. And I've always um, find it to be um, extremely impactful um, uh, by, uh, having them on um, um, management, on medical management for ADHD. And another big, big category, of course, is autism. And um, in our patient populations, especially with the intractable uh, epilepsy, 20% of the ch children with epilepsy have uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, the majority of these children with epilepsy who have autism also demonstrate severe intellectual disability. And I think that becomes a concern, the difficulty in differentiating severe to profound ID from ASD, I think becomes a real concern. Um, and the full understanding of the link between the two is probably lies uh, at the bottom, at the heart of it, that um, as, uh, given that there is now supporting growing evidence that there are a number of gen common genetic mutations leading to both condition um, uh, supports this explanation. And managing both conditions, of course, uh, would be extremely, um, um, extremely helpful. And both uh, epilepsy and autism are uh, associated with higher rates of coexistence, psychiatric and behavioral problems. And this complex interplay, um, I think, um, has many folds, given that there is actually a phenotypic overlap in presentations of epileptic encephalopathies and autism spectrum disorder. Um, and we know that some certain epileptic encephalopathies, such as IS, are more commonly associated with developmental of ASD. I've personally made the choice of um, having an early developmental assessment on essentially most of patients that I uh, get uh, that I follow in my clinic with infantile spasms because I find these are very it's a very delicate diagnosis uh, IS is uh, at a very delicate time point so I really want to make sure that we don't miss any um, underlying uh, neurodevelopmental diagnosis and I, and as we alluded to in a study published a few years ago they identified that there was a, about a 50 percent overlap of genes uh, that were implicated both in for developmental of ASD and epileptic encephalopathy so there's a rich genetic uh, overlap, and as and as as we were alluding to earlier, and I would like to then get your feed, uh, get your experience on, is the difficulty in differentiating severe to profound ID from ASD. And I'd like to just focus a, a, a bit on the impact of actually using some of our non. Um, um, non, um, uh, uh, like essentially non-pharmacoresistant uh, therapies such as um, vagal nerve stimulator and epilepsy surgery and their impact on ASD. These are really preliminary data. Uh, often patients ask us uh, if we use the vagal nerve stimulator, which I'm, I, I'm sure um, uh, your team is aware. It's it's a it's a it's it's a stimulation responsive. Um, um, uh, it, it's a stimulation responsive um, method for management of seizures. And this is offered to patients with drug resistant epilepsy. So once medications fail and we move into non-pharmacy, um, essentially moving beyond uh, medical treatment, we then talk about things like ketogenic diet and vagal nerve stimulator. We actually know fairly well that treatments like, in, like, a, like such as ketogenic diet can also impact positively impact um, uh, comorbidities such as ASD, but there's now some very preliminary data to even show that 
um, uh, the stable vagus nerve stimulator settings can also positively affect the autistic behaviors. And it really provides some preliminary clinical data that it may benefit younger children with drug-resistant epilepsy comorbidities such as DRE. And this is demonstrated here again on, 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 a, on a follow-up where some of these um, features such as sensory, body and objective use, language and social and self-care needs have improved in follow-up compared to when they were seen initially. And this is uh, some, um, uh, this is again, and a very it's a hot topic uh, in our patients that are surgical candidates, um, because it used to be that um, that we the surgical um, option was um, was uh, felt to felt to have been suitable for patients who who were who had a more of an underlying normal developmental uh, status as opposed to patients who had developmental effect against cephalopathy or, or ASD. And this study um, from a few years ago uh, and some similar studies uh, along the way have suggested that that's that that's that for that not to be true, uh, that we find that patients who have severe comorbidities also experience significant benefit, not only from a seizure perspective, but also from a um, but also from um, um, behavioral and developmental perspective, uh, that they found that 18 of their 56 patients had more than uh, one operation. So again, that speaks to the severity of their patient population. The mean age of surgery was about 12 years of age. And aggression and other apparent behavior observed in the clinical setting improved in about half of their patients. And even severely affected individuals, um, um, surgery had some tangible benefits and reducing the burden of not only the seizures, but also the aberrant behaviors. And this is, again, what we see in our patient populations as well. And angle classification is what we use, is the terminology we use for their, it's only strictly um, based on their seizure outcome. For example, angle class one uh, means a complete seizure freedom. And we see that mostly with what we call resective uh, surgeries, as opposed to palliative surgeries and VNS and corpus callosotomies are considered palliative surgeries. And of course, in this patient population, you'll see angle, angle class four, which is um, you know, not a good seizure control or seizure recurrence um, of uh, at the same uh, intensity as it was pre-surgical. Pre-surgery uh, is uh, reported mostly in patients with palliative surgery versus in those with re resective surgery, you see more of an angle one, where you just uh, take the lesion out or you disconnect the two hemispheres, or you do um, you know, and lobectomies of different um, kinds, temporal or extratemporal. So of course, in patients that, that have a very good uh, response from a surgical perspective, it goes without saying that it also can impact their behavior uh, and some of the autistic features. Uh, we actually had a patient who was diagnosed with severe epilepsy and autism that very recently underwent a corpus callosotomy in the palliative group and patients and parents report a very dramatic improvement in patients' attentiveness, learning, and communication. So again, very important to keep in mind uh, to try to really push the envelope for um, management of these patients if the option resides. So now I'm going to move. I know we're um, about 15 minutes to the hour, so I have a few slides on what I like to focus on on the on the, with the with the focus on the future and the promise of research. Um, so we, you know, knowing that epilepsy is the third leading contributor to a global burden of neurological disorders and affects about 65 million people worldwide. We talked about through this talk that based on clinical and EEG features, we try to really dig deep into the etiology and comorbidities uh, and try to categorize patients and try to really understand what their epilepsy is. And we are, um, are really are uh, trying to... Um, uh, the promise of the future is really to understand the intrinsic variabilities of epilepsy manifestation in each individual patient and understand the response to therapy. So with that, we're really trying to focus on early standardized genetic testing. And with any genetic diagnosis, with any uniform diagnosis, we know that it really sends the patient down a very targeted pathway of opening the door for a functional studies, some understanding better the pathophysiological and underlying mechanisms, 
and really move towards more personalized therapies. And also another focus of what I do is really to look at neural networks. And you know, epilepsy is really known to be a network disorder. So I do pledge that uh, you know not, that, that that the underlying genetic cause uh, really directly impacts the network formation um, in the brain, and that again in turn um, um, explains why patients experience even with the same genetic abnormality experience variable phenotypic um, abnormality. And the goal of the, I think the, the, the promise of the future and the promise of the research is to move more towards uh, precision medicine with a unified diagnosis, move, move towards clinical trials and embark on early intervention. So as I said, a focus and one of my uh, the focus, uh, a research focus is to understand epilepsy as a network disease. This is also proven to be not only in the generalized epilepsy, but also in focal epilepsies. We know that the significance of brain networks in epilepsy is not only uh, when it comes to epilepsy surgery, but also in severity of comorbidities, many of which we have discussed now. So what we try to work on is really um, embark on some network analysis and longitudinal follow these children over time to try to understand how their brain networks alter um, through, um, uh, through, through their epilepsy journey. And that can mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, changes in medication and that can take into account changes of medication and their um, severity of their uh, presentation. And this is really just a, um, a very snapshot of some of the uh, work that we're doing. We're looking at both diffusional and um, uh, structural and functional connectivity um, to try to understand how these networks alter over time and whether it can inform uh, some of the cognitive difficulties these patients uh, face. And if they end up going to epilepsy surgery, if there are any early biomarkers at the network neuroimaging level that we can identify that can then predict if they are going to do better after epilepsy surgery or not. Now, going back to this, another focus, uh, like uh, I was saying, is focusing really on early and standardized genetic testing. So together with the genetics team, we've come up with a study called PAGE. This is pediatric autoimmune and genetic testing in epilepsy. Um, this is, again, trying to really advance and broaden, broaden our, um, uh, our di diagnostic abilities uh, when we're dealing with patients with drug-resistant epilepsy. So our work has been to really uh, try to intervene early. Uh, we've uh, this is uh, uh, through uh, um, uh, again a collaboration with the genetics um, uh, co colleagues, Dr. Balchi. Uh, we try to uh, uh, test patients with who have been newly diagnosed with drug resistant epilepsy, and so far with the 35 patients that have been enrolled into the study, we see that we've had about 33% uh, rate of positive results. And the autoimmune testing, of course, in our patient population, not unexpectedly, have been much more slim. And, but this study has come from a background of many years of collaborations with the genetics team and overall through a combined uh, clinic in the comprehensive epilepsy clinic and genetics, uh, we've been able to um, uh, scan and uh, we've been able to test about 100 patients and our diagnostic yield has been 26%. And again, this is not only making a diagnosis, I think this has led to many other um, avenues, uh, including uh, what I like to think of as precision medicine and really a personalized treatment. And when we look at, and I'm not showing that data, but essentially the impact of our genetic uh, diagnosis and intervention and counseling has been almost upwards of 90%. Most of these genetic diagnoses really from our perspective, uh, from a neurological perspective and epilepsy management perspective has been um, giving us very firm directions as to what medication to avoid and what medications to use. And in some cases, even avoid polypharmacy or choose more targeted and improved um, and improve a really care of these patients. So we see some of the genes that are we, that are considered actionable. Uh, you see SCN1A, like we discussed, these are patients that we um, like to avoid sodium channel blockers. These are um, most of the time um, uh, due to a loss of function. Um, and, uh, and for that reason, we wanna avoid anything that would again uh, block up the sodium channels. This is in contrast to 
uh, SCN2A or SCN8A, where you have gain of function. And we actually, in these patients, do use a sodium channel blocker and patients respond beautifully. Uh, most of the time, same goes with KCNQ2. For example, once we get a diagnosis of KCNQ2, we know that by using a sodium channel blocker as our medication of choice, a patient has a very great chance of becoming seizure free. And a, and, and a bit um, uh, on what's, what's out in the pipeline and what we hope that could essentially change, uh, you know, change the game for these patients with uh, with uh, Dravé syndrome or those with SCN1A mutation. Um, so as I said, it's the most common single gene mutation and it, that's associated with Dravé syndrome is SCN1A. So we know that in these patients, about 50%, there's a 50% decrease in expression of function of a protein called NAV1.1. And this is a condition called haploinsufficiency. So what, one thing that the, uh, that the scientists have tried to do is try to replace this gene, but the issue is that it's a very big gene and, and and getting it to the brain. So it's a big gene to be to to be placed in a vector and getting it to the brain is difficult. So what they're doing is really two um, gene therapies. One of its kind is the first gene therapy um, really being carried out internationally um, um, uh, in Drave, not in Canada, but they either target the RNA regulation or the DNA regulation. And really the goal is to be able to fix the underlying problem. And of course, the society at large is really eagerly waiting to hear about the outcomes. Uh, but there are, there are in phase two going on to phase three trials. And uh, another, before I move on and go to and wrap up, uh, I wanted to then quickly talk about this uh, again, importance of um, making the underlying diagnosis and the promise of, of, of um, being able to um, uh, collate our patients and learn from them is what we're seeing now in patients with TSC, where the diagnosis not only, of course, impacts the patient, but it has a very good, um, uh, you know, it, it's showing to have a lot of uh, benefit for future pregnancies, or even when these patients are diagnosed in utero, to then try to pre-screen them. So, um, so even before, so this EPISTOP trial, which has been a really sentinel trial in TSC, has proposed the, that in about 100 patients with TSC, their goal was to compare whether we can be proactive or reactive uh, when we're dealing with uh, infantile spasm in the context of TSC. So what this study has shown us is that uh, patients are um, uh, patients who are being preemptively treated with bigabitrin um, as a preventative therapy do not end up developing the infantile spasm uh, instead of so those patients ended up doing much much ended up not developing infantile spasm compared to patients that were only reactively treated uh, after uh, they were diagnosed with infantile spasm with the same medication so this has really now changed our practice that we are screening patients with TSC with serial EEGs and when we see an abnormality on EEG we treat them with bigabitrin for two years and this has helped uh, prevent 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 the, uh, the, the occurrence of infantile spasms. And we do know and in, uh, in parallel that there is evidence that developmental delay in TSC is associated with earlier onset, earlier onset of seizures. So we do believe that if we delay um, the seizure onset age, that we will in, in return impact their developmental outcome and even the, um, the occurrence of ASD in these patients. This is being also studied, studied in a new um, uh, trial, uh, but the results have not been yet published. So we still don't know the long-term impact of development with serial EEG monitoring, but it's something that we're waiting to uh, learn more about. So back to our case and to summarize, so he was diagnosed with lanos gastos syndrome and autism spectrum disorder. He was also diagnosed with a, a, a barrel Meckin syndrome due to a COP-B1 mutation that would well explain his infantile onset developmental delay and eventual intellectual disability in autism. His seizure management changed um, somewhat. Again, this wasn't one of the consequential genes, but at least it gave us an explanation and it gave parents some peace of mind that it wasn't something that they did or did not do um, uh, that, um, that led 
to where he is right now, but uh, he was treated with aquaric acid, CBD oil, and also with consideration of the vagus nerve stimulator. So really for him, he did have a severe uh, developmental epileptic encephalopathy. He also had a, a simultaneous diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder and ended up having an etiology specific disorder due to an underlying genetic disorder. So I hope that through this talk, we've been able to discuss that the diagnosis of the cause of epilepsy is very important. And I think um, to get into very advanced therapeutic, we really need to improve our diagnostics and understands and, and really never give up uh, and try to make that unknown category as smaller, as, po as small as possible. Uh, with better access to genetic testing, we've been able to redefine a new classification uh, terminology has emerged. Most importantly, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy is a new definition that occurs when both developmental impairment and epileptic activity independently influence the neurocognitive and behavioral outcomes. Many DEEs are related to gene mutations that are also often implicated in, in, in ASD and can present in infancy and early childhood. And the time is initiation of treatment, whether it's medical or surgical in patients with DEE can result, of course, in improved seizure control and, and open the gate for precision uh, therapy and may lead to improved cognitive outcomes. With that, I thank you, um, and I really look forward to your questions. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Miriam. That was a fantastic review and a lot of food for thought, as they say, but that was a really wonderful uh, review. So we have uh, time. So we only, in theory, have five minutes, but as long as you're willing to stay, Miriam, we'll be here. Um, so if people have questions, if people could use the raise hand function, it's a lot easier. And that way we could also use voices and have some discussion. Uh, but uh, if you will insist upon using the Q&A, that is fine uh, also, I suppose. Let, let, if I can, Mary, let me just start. So, so people talk about things lowering the seizure threshold. And right. It's never been clear to me what that actually means as a phrase. Right. Uh, and how is that actually determined? Uh, that I that's a very good point. I, I you know, I we often talk about this and I also see this this fear of with all, most of the primary care physicians as well, that everybody's like, yeah, it's okay, ADHD, no big deal. You know, if the patient has epilepsy, it's probably, the, it's because, it's probably the seizure medications or it's the epilepsy. And so that's why I think sometimes we think about it, but we're so scared to treat it. I really, I think these are really old data. Uh, I personally have never taken it um, too seriously. And I, I say that I say that with a grain of salt, because I know that it's really, it's a very well known concept. And we have, you know, been sworn by it, and we abide by it. Uh, but I don't really know the significance of it. If this if the patient is being treated with one or two or three anti seizure medication, what else can what what does a lower seizure threshold mean? Of course, I mean, I guess what it means is that if the patient is sick, we know that there is a higher chance of patient experiencing a seizure. But I really, I'm always advocating for management of ADHD, as you know, and uh, and so uh, I think there's so much to gain from that. That I think this uh, this notion of lower seizure threshold really gets uh, hyped up uh, for reasons that I really can't explain. I feel like this is a, it's one of the old notions in the literature that just needs to be challenged and probably redefined. I don't believe in it. <laughs> But in reality, when people say it lowers the clinic, the seizure threshold, does that just mean that it increases the risk of seizures? Yeah, it, that just probably breakthrough seizures. Just that's what, what we talk about when we talk about I infections. And so probably it's exactly the same thing, but, uh, uh, but, but it's probably very trivial because, um, you know, infection, there is an acute onset, acute offset. And these patients, and if, unless they chronically tell you that since they started the stimulant, the seizures are out of control, which has never been the case, really. I mostly see the opposite impact as, as, as the fact that the child is, starts doing so well, because I think they are, already have very little reserve. So once you help them, uh, they really can push forward versus when they're untreated is the opposite. But, and I think one of the problems, too, is that in, the, uh, in any sort of product monographs, for any psychiatric medicine, essentially, it always says, you know, may lower the seizure threshold or something like that. And as you said, there's almost no evidence to support that. And about 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, somebody went to the FDA in the United States and got through a Freedom of Information Act um, request, they got sort of post-marketing data on essentially every psychiatric medicine uh, to look at the rate of seizures. 
And I think that, you know, so their sample size is like 80, 90,000 people, if there's anything that's been reported. And what they found was that there were a few medicines in psychiatry that clearly increased the risk of seizures, which, which we know of anyway. So there's clozapine, uh, bupropion, I think alanzapine may have also, and, and perhaps um, uh, Seroquel. But for the rest, they actually didn't increase the risk of seizures. And in fact, there was some debate about whether SSRIs may have lowered the risk of seizures in people. Now, I, I assume all none of those people and they reported, I have to go back and look. I don't know if any of them actually had epilepsy, so it may be a different population. Right. But, but nonetheless, that's, that's the important distinction that if these patients have epilepsy, they already have a lower threshold compared to a non patient with, that doesn't have epilepsy and they're already on seizure medication. So that's my argument. We right. right. And, 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 but, but would it actually increase the risk of seizures? And we don't know easily, I think. I mean, certainly, as, as you said, and I, I, I hate to bug you, but I always want somebody to bless it whenever I'm going to start somebody with seizures on, on any kind of medicine. But I, I have not personally, I don't think, uh, seen anybody who had increased seizures with any psychiatric medicine, frankly. Now that's excluding clozapine and propion because right. they don't use them. But in general, right. it hasn't been my experience. And I don't know if anybody else has. So uh, Jessica Jakovchik, uh, who is a um, well, nutrition in London. Uh, let me just, uh, where is the list of, all right, there we go. Uh, so uh, Jess, why don't you uh, go ahead? All you have to do is unmute yourself. Hi, Jess. Hi, Miriam. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. Awesome talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, I don't know if, um, are you supposed to see my camera or no? No, you yeah, didn't. Okay. Rob doesn't want to see my face. Got it. No, I've uh, got, it's got nothing to do with me. I would assume that you're just not showing it for some reason. Yeah, that's okay. I look great. Um, so, um, yeah, very good talk, Miriam. I love it. I love that it's linking it with with a lot of the stuff that I do out here in the community with all the sort of behavior and, um, and developmental problems. Um, question, two questions for you. With the ADHD and epilepsy, with the sort of up to 60% of kids with intractable epilepsy have ADHD, um, have they done studies which showed maybe which stimulants, if any, would work better or which medications would work better? And the next question is, um, do they tend to respond the same way to the stimulant medication? So like in FASD, we know that they're not going to respond the same way to um, the stimulant medication. So we have to kind of tweak and work a different way. So, yes. Right. Um, so great question. I, the 60, I think, um, yeah, I, I uh, the, in terms of what we typically, and I know, again, stimulants have been been fraught upon a little bit, but uh, I, most of the studies report that stimulants, in fact, are the drug of choice. And between the stimulants, I think is really just based on patient's profile. I haven't personally found one to be more superior than the other. I think I always probably, like most of you, we're in search of finding uh, something that helps. And some of the side effects of the stimulants can be unbearable at times to families. So we need to often switch from one to the other. I haven't, um, I don't know if you have, or Rob, if you have more experience with that, that whether one stimulant is more effective, I just uh, always advocate for a use of stimulants in patients who have, um, uh, who have uh, uh, ADHD, especially, and I know that that stimulant is probably not the first choice in the preschool ADHD, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I would love to get your feedback on it. I personally, especially when it comes to preschool ADHD, try not to try to send them to, uh, to developmental peds because I, I, they just do a wonderful job in, in managing and following the patients. Um, um, so I'd love to get what your, what your experience on that has been. I think with people with, in preschoolers, I think it's debatable, right? And there's not a lot of good evidence one way or the other. It's just not a lot of studies, unfortunately, but right. I think, so in people who don't have epilepsy, there are some people I know who would say that, you know, that uh, dextroamphetamine is better for inattention and methylphenidate is better for hyperactivity or the other way around. Personally, and I, if anybody else has an opinion, please say so, because I, I don't know, I'm not sure I believe it because I don't think our ability to measure human behavior is all that good personally. Uh, and so I'm just not convinced of it. The, um, if Jess, if you or if anybody else would like, uh, Miriam sort of pointed me in the direction of a couple of papers. One, I think it's a position paper from the International League Against Epilepsy. And there was some other, I think, um, not a review paper, but large look at people with, who had epilepsy taking stimulants. 
And, and I think they were both focused mostly on methylphenidate, actually, not so much on dextroamphetamine. And so I, I, I can't comment on the dextroamphetamine part, but the two studies, if anybody would like them, just email me and let me know, because I think they both pretty clearly said there was no clinical evidence of increased seizures in people with epilepsy taking methylphenidate at appropriate doses when used cautiously and so on. Yes. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And Rob, do, do you guys, like, do you find in your experience that that they will sort of respond in a similar manner, that you start low, go slow, and when you see a good response, you're good? Um, that's, been, that's been my experience. However, you know, I, I think, again, we're talking about different, it depends on who you're talking about, right? So, you know, if we're talking about people with significant cognitive impairments also, we know they don't tend to respond as well, or it's not as obvious. But uh, there's a girl I'm thinking of who... Um, Miriam had referred to me a couple of years ago because pretty significant, fairly rapid onset obsessive compulsive disorder, but over time became clear she also had significant ADHD. Uh, and, and on methylphenidate, she actually did really well, apart from the fact that she was fairly thin to begin with and started losing weight. Uh, but, but in terms of the actual effectiveness of the medicine, she did very, very well uh, with a stimulant. And so yeah, I, I, that, I, I think my experience has been that they have, uh, depending upon sort of the presentation and, and, and other comorbid problems. Do you find that's, uh, that's, that's, um, uh, that with the, that you're, you're, I think you're asking going, you know, starting low, going slow. Um, do you find that uh, that's been different in your patients with epilepsy or is that, that's uh, the, 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 the slow part is too slow or uh, what has been your experience? I'm just curious. I don't I, like, I've just been sitting here thinking and I don't, I don't think I have enough kiddos to really to really say I do have one right now that has a that fits all of these things very nicely that I've just been thinking the whole time and um we kind of just said oh she's a bit busy or whatever but now I'm like oh my god I think really I'm gonna have to do you know bite the bullet diagnose ADHD and get her going at some point um so it's making me think of her um but yeah I don't think I have enough to really get a good you know I don't have a big end to really understand right. what's going on in my practice with those kiddos. I just don't uh, think they, I don't think they react any differently. And I think just um, as you know, I think it's just a, keeping the side effect profile in mind and, and the profile of the child, I think. And uh, and that probably comes down. I don't think that apart from methylphenidate that you were pointing out that there's any other epilepsy recommendations specifically. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, our, well, uh, thanks, Jesty. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Ogilvy, uh, if you would like to go ahead. Thanks, Miriam, for an awesome talk. You and I have chatted about a lot of uh, mutual patients as well. So I just thought I'd add to that discussion um, and what Jess was asking that my experience, that I tend to use that point about the intellectual disability is more what, similar in terms of the response to medication. I don't necessarily see any differences in terms of the kiddos with epilepsy. And I would say it's going to be a biased sample in the sense that a lot of those kiddos have comorbid epilepsy and intellectual disability. Um, so that's it'd be an interesting thing to actually look at what might be driving that kind of go low, start low, go slow. But I think in the preschool population, I don't use anything different um, as I would with children with developmental disability, intellectual disability um, in terms of their response. What I do have found, though, I've gone more to uh, fast acting, so not our, our long acting first line stimulant medication to sometimes be able to really titrate the dose a little um, more precisely um, because they are they are little and presenting with some pretty impairing symptoms uh, to treat early. So that's been my observation, um, but uh, really good overview, Miriam. Thanks for thanks for all the content, especially talking about the new language around developmental encephalopathy encephalopathies. Right. And uh, thank you, Jackie. I, I again rely so much on all of your expertise in managing these comorbidities. I mean, I think our our, our collaboration has been, uh, you know, it has been extremely important for our patients and and for for our growing interest. So I do. I mean, and I think that becomes a, that always is a question that I think in your that's in your mind and also ours is how difficult it is to make a diagnosis of autism in a patient who has a very severe intellectual disability, or they have the developmental epileptic encephalopathy. 
And I find, I mean, um, and, and again, I've seen patients that I would no doubt have had a diagnosis of ASD. And for example, things like surgery come along and, and you know, that may change and that may shift. So, um, so I wonder um, how you guys approach that uh, from a, the developmental perspective, because you really make the diagnosis. I, I rely on your observations purely. Go, go ahead, Jackie. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I guess that was the next point I was going to bring up was that um, we've we haven't talked about uh, you know how we're assessing children's developmental um, and cognitive profiles, especially in the really young kids. We do what we can in clinic to do the tools that we're able to uh, to to administer to get a sense of their developmental level. But the younger they are, it can be harder to get a sense of is or you know really convince be convinced that this their behavior or their their function is not in keeping with their developmental level, um, right? So like ADHD, low attention, hyperactivity, and a four year old who's presenting like you know uh, more like a younger eighteen month old. Um, that's often what's going through my mind when I'm doing that assessment and trying to compare how those behaviors are relative to the rest to the rest of their development. And I think that's something we could do a better job with, especially as the kids get into early school age, whereas to your point, they're you're trying to navigate them through the school system. And in my experience, I'm getting more um, comments from learning supports teachers saying these kids are really complex. Some our our education psychologists really aren't feeling like they have all the skill set to assess and do what really these kids should have a neuropsychology assessment as opposed to a psychoeducational assessment to look at all the different types of memory and attention. Um, so I think that's an area we could do a better job at and would actually help clarify some of our diagnoses um, and, and move them upstream to be to be a bit more clear about what we're treating. You know, I, I, I agree, Jackie. And I think that it's all these things make it difficult. I think what personally the one that I find hard is in kids who are younger, who are re, who appear to have autism, but are really, really hyperactive. Yeah. And it's difficult sometimes to get a good sense of what's going on. And what I always keep my fingers crossed and hope for is that if we treat them with a stimulant, it'll become clearer. I don't know that that's the reality. Uh, just like um, uh, we often see kids, so, you know, we're not sure. We'll say, okay, let's see them back in six months on the assumption that it'll be clearer. And it almost never is, unfortunately. I know. Certainly, I've seen a few kids uh, who were really hyperactive and on stimulants seem to make a big, big difference in terms of their presentation. A few, not a lot. Didn't? Make no, it did. Okay. Did in a few, but not as many as I would have liked. It, and I, but I think that's more of a problem with our nomenclature and the DSM system is that there are all kinds of human behaviors that aren't going to be captured easily in that system. And there are all kinds of other variables that it doesn't take into account, including things like epilepsy and stuff like that. Yeah. And so I think, Miriam, to your point about, you know, the children with profound, severe intellectual disability versus or and autism. And I think, Rob, we've talked even in this forum about how to differentiate some of those um, those behaviors and how difficult it can be. So the younger you are, the younger we're seeing these kids, it's if they're to me, one of the things is I'm always I was always taught, you know, looking at their developmental and cognitive level, if they have to kind of reach at least reach that 12 month mark. Um, but that's you're doing really relying on, you know, getting col collaborating information from where the kiddos um, spending time to get a sense of their function, how they're doing both in and out of the home to, to figure that out. So um, but again, I think that's where we, we try our best doing clinical observations. Um, but that's the population that we make kind of clinical diagnoses. And I've written been more often writing letters to school, providing what I'm calling a clinical diagnosis of intellectual disability, kind of uh, unspecified little I, little D, um, by no way trying to proclaim, you know, that we've done a full assessment and then very clear about that. But some schools are willing to um, use that to advocate for um, different supports and funding. So actually, I learned that through you, Jackie, that you guys can't, you can't, like, it's not the way things are set up that, uh, that making a formal diagnosis of intellectual disability is really not, not done in clinics, right? It's done through the psychoed assessment. But, but this, you know, and, and apologies to any psychologist in the audience, I mean, it, but, you know, people with intellectual disabilities existed long before IQ tested yeah. uh, and, and, and were always diagnosed. And I think, especially, you know, I think, I think for many IQ tests, maybe most 
you know, the lowest score you can get. So if you show up and you're breathing kind of thing and can do some very simple tests, it's like 41 or 42. So for people with more severe intellectual disabilities, they're not good at distinguishing or, or even measuring that. And I think we can, if people with significant disabilities, I think we can diagnose that. Now, whether the school accepts that or not is very debatable because I've had, and the, what I always go back to is, you know, people with Down syndrome, we know that, I don't know if we can say 100%, essentially 100% are going to develop uh, intellectual disabilities or be diagnosed with it. And so if somebody is four or five with, with Down syndrome and is very far behind, you know, I, I don't know why we don't say they have an intellectual disability, but I've had schools, I've written letters for schools at times at their request saying somebody has an intellectual disability. And then they've written me back and said, well, how do I know? And I want to write, well, you know, if we look at the criteria, do they have significant deficits in cognitive functions? Yes. Do they have significant deficits in, in adaptive functions? Yes. Uh, ergo, they have an intellectual disability. But it, it's, it's, I think it's an appropriate diagnosis to make clinically if warranted, but what it means to any funder or any organization is a different question altogether, I think, unfortunately. And I will tell you from a workup perspective that sometimes, you know, when we're trying to do genetic testing, also we rely so much on these nomenclatures. Like we are, we have a patient and like, oh, unless they get a formal diagnosis of ASD, we can't proceed with any testing, right? So I'm like, oh, they're seeing Rob in two weeks or something. Like they are very strict, of course. I mean, they and, and ID or, or provisional diagnosis of ID and, and all of this, of course, becomes, plays an important part when we're trying to even decide how, expansive their workup can be and how the ministry would fund that. So they're all very interconnected. And yet, uh, and I think you've had similar cases where, you know, the school needs to know if the patient has ID and then it, you know, and, and you know, they're all, everybody's overall relying so much, of course, on these um, um, diagnoses um, that I actually don't even know how to make, but my life relies so much on it. So, but, but you know, I, I, and I think what Jackie was asking, again, if anybody else has any opinions, please, Please feel free to, to join it. But what Jackie was saying about distinguishing or diagnosing autism in, really, in kids with really severe and profound intellectual disabilities, that I, I think what we know is that instruments that we traditionally use are not good at that in people with really severe cognitive impairments. Uh, but a um, an epileptologist I've always looked up to from Southern Africa, let's say, once said to me that even children with really, and I think the phrase was mashed brains, uh, are still can be very social still. Right. Uh, and smile. And, and I think the one thing that the DSM added in DSM-5 was that it now says that in people with intellectual disabilities, in order to make a diagnosis of autism, their social communication abilities have to be markedly below their developmental ability. Right. Which, again, the lower you go in ability, it's harder and harder to find that distinction. But that's what Jackie said is exactly the way I think about it. You know, people with severe intellectual disabilities, do we need another diagnosis to explain their social difficulties? Or does the social does this intellectual disability by itself account for those things. Right. And so I guess what you're saying, if they have ASD, do you need to go as far as making a diagnosis of severe intellectual disability or vice versa? I think they are not related. They they are not, already, yeah. They're, or they're you're not, saying if they have a severe ID, then we don't, it doesn't really matter if we make it, like they don't need to really. No, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, well, that's, that's a very different question. And, I, and people with profound intellectual disabilities, I sometimes ask, when people ask if they have autism, I sometimes want to ask, you know, why, what, what difference does it make, really? Because they're right. going to need care all their life. But certainly, I think what the DSM is suggests is that you should make any appropriate diagnoses. And so autism doesn't necessarily include or exclude intellectual disability and, and vice versa. So, and we know that 20 to 30, well, depends on time and stuff, but right now, I think about a third of people with autism also get comorbid diagnosis of intellectual disability. Right. But it's more just that in people with really severe disabilities, intellectually, distinguishing it from autism is, is not easy. Correct. Yes, that's that's been really our experience as well. And of course, adding to that is that having that diagnosis also opens up some resources for them as well through the government and, and all that. So then again, becomes a... But that's a double-edged sword. Uh, trust me on that. I mean, that drives all sorts of, uh, of things. Uh, yeah. You know, Ben Goldberg was here. He was uh, one of the founders of CPR. He's left now, I think. It would have been great to hear his perspective on how you know, historically how people would distinguish between autism and, and intellectual disabilities. And I think in some ways when there weren't criteria that had to be followed, it might've been easier, probably much more all over the place, but more straightforward in um, in some ways. So one question, Miriam, and just for me, you know, that, that I think what has often been said is that we don't know why people with autism in particular have higher rates of uh, intellectual disability and, and epilepsy at the same time. We know there are some clear causes of autism that like tuberous sclerosis, 
fragile X and things like that that may be associated with higher rates of epilepsy. But with the rest, we, we don't really know. I mean, do you have any theories about that? Or is it just the brain is not working? Talk well? about the, especially when, in, when, especially with patients. Are we? Are you talking about the patients who have like the the the, the why is there a, a, a co association between epilepsy and autism? Yep. Right. Um, I think that's. I mean, um, it, there's been a, a few papers here and there, and I try to delve into it a little bit. But really, most of it relies on really not knowing. And I think one of the one of the theories that, uh, that have been entertained in some studies and then has been rejected by others is even association of severity of autism on interictal epileptiform discharges on EEG. And there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's actually been a study that suggested that it can have a protective impact on some of the positive behaviors. So it's very, so again, trying to look for avenues to try to explain at least um, and the severity, and when it comes to severity of one versus the other, whether one can explain the other, and I don't think we've we've gone there. The only thing we've come close to is the fact that there is this that rich genetic overlap between the two conditions. But we're really talking about patients who have an overt, like with really severe epilepsy and really severe autism. But you're probably talking about your run of the mill patients with autism that have a much higher chance of developing, you know, uh, so patients who don't have. Uh, DRE. Like if you're talking about a patient with autism that develops epilepsy, their epilepsy is much easier to control, actually. Really? It's not very difficult to control. Most of those patients that have are well diagnosed, you know, well into their diagnosis of autism and develop seizures are generally, you know, one to two seizures may have an abnormal EEG respond to one medication. Whereas the other way around, patients who have severe epilepsy and on autism on top just walk work in, which is walk into a different category, which would then be, uh, you know, your DEEs and, and all of that. Uh, but in terms of um, um, finding a common ground um, that the jury is still out. So, but I wonder if, because we know that people with autism have higher rates of macrocephaly, and I wonder if people who don't have obvious genetic causes of autism, is it the people with significant macrocephaly, are they the ones at higher risk of epilepsy? And, and I, I don't know, I just, I wonder in my head, I mean, do you have any sense of that? And we're talking about, again, non-syndromic autistic kids, right? Yeah. Um, whether if they have, if they, if they have micro, whether they have higher chance of developing. No, mac macrocephaly. Macro. Oh, yes. Macro is often reported. Uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, yes, I mean, I guess we use that to uh, a screen for, you know, fragile X and things like that uh, yep. when we see the macrocephaly. Um, however, again, we're talking about when, when we have the syndromic causes, it's totally a different ballgame. But in the non-syndromic cases, we do use that as a universal tool to screen for genetics, like we do a, a microarray and test for fragile X and all that. So, yeah. We definitely uh, use that as, as a marker. I didn't use to screen all of my patients with severe autism, uh, but I do now, irrespective of the head size. I think there's just so much value. It's such a cheap test to do, and 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 it gives people a lot of uh, sense of direction. So I do. I have a very low threshold for at least a microarray in all patients with autism. Yeah, I think, frankly, I agree. I mean, one of the problems sometimes is actually getting the blood, but which is the most complicated part for some kids. But yeah, no, I, th I think it's definitely worthwhile. It has been a much more, many more findings than I might've expected personally. Yes. And I always, exactly. And I always banked the DNA in case there was something that came out of it and you need to do more testing. But, um, but I, I'll tell you if a patient has autism and epilepsy uh, in our clinics, for sure, they will get a small panel and most of them end up getting a whole exome sequencing. Really our, our practice has shifted there. We don't even do the big epilepsy panel here because if you have more than 100 genes, if you test more than 100 genes, you can't do whole exome. So we try to be a little really? you know, sneaky there. So we do check, check for smaller panels, but again, autism in and of itself and autism and epilepsy together really buys you a, a whole uh, fluke of uh, a, a genetic testing. Especially right. again, I, if it's hard to treat epilepsy, yeah. Which is what you do for a living, I suppose. Right. So, the, exactly. uh, so, so you know, uh, thank you, Mary. This was a fantastic talk. If there are any other questions or comments, please uh, go ahead. Uh, this was a great know. opportunity. Um, thank you so much. I, it was a pleasure to join, and I really much I really uh, learn a lot and enjoy our interactions on many level and. And um, uh, and I hope that we grow uh, our mutual interests and program more and more, and uh, we can try to uh, overcome some of the obstacles.
One is one that we have often spoken with Jackie about is trying to get some of uh, some neuropsych evaluations at the hospital for some of these kids in the community. But our resources, unfortunately, do not support that at all. Very cool. So, you know, and, and again, I thank you, Mary. It was fantastic. And, you know, I, I, I perhaps at least clinically the highest compliment I can pay you is that the number of parents I've seen of kids who've spoken glowingly of you uh, is is a relatively large number. So and people oh, thank appreciate it. That's very good to hear. And I yep. know we share a lot of patients. Thank yep. you. 